from verse 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up, tempting him, and saying, Teacher, having done what shall I inherit life eternal? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? But he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thine understanding, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said to him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. But he, desirous of justifying himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus replying said, A certain man descended from Jerusalem, Jericho, and fell into the hands of robbers, who also, having stripped him and inflicted wounds, went away, leaving him in a half-dead state. And a certain priest happened to go down that way, and seeing him, passed on on the opposite side, and in like manner also a Levite, being at the spot, came and looked at him and passed on on the opposite side. But a certain Samaritan journeying, came to him, and seeing him, was moved with compassion, and came up to him, and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and having put him on his own feet, took him to the inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow, as he left, taking out two denarii, he gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou shalt expend more, I will render to thee on my coming back. Which now of these three seems to thee to have been neighbor of him who fell into the hands of the robber? And he said, He that showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, Go, and do thou likewise. And it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman, Martha by name, received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who also, having sat down at the feet of Jesus, was listening to his word. Now Mary was distracted with much serving, and coming up she said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Speak to her, therefore, that she may help me. But Jesus answering said to her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but there is need of one. And Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken from her. So far the reading of the scripture. We have noticed in chapter 9, verse 51, that the second part of the book starts. We've seen the first part is coming into this world. The second part, the Lord going out of this world. And we have noticed then also how he is on a journey, because this going out will take place in Jerusalem as we have seen in chapter 9. And in 951, the second part, we read, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. And there are several references in this portion that ends in chapter 19. So from chapter 9, the second part, till chapter 19, we see the Lord on his journey to Jerusalem. However, Luke does not follow a strict chronological order. He puts things together in a moral way. We have noticed that already in chapter 1, verse 3. The introduction of the book. He put things together, led by the Holy Spirit, in a moral way. And so not necessarily in a chronological order. And that is, for example, the case with chapter 10 to 38. Um, the visit there in Bethany. Bethany was only two miles away from Jerusalem. So in chapter 9, verse 51, the Lord is in Galilee. He starts his last journey to Jerusalem. He had, had other journeys before, as you know from John's Gospel. But this is his last journey to Jerusalem. And so what uh, is described here in chapter 10, 38 is not necessarily in chronological order. Now we have seen how the Lord extended the testimony, first by sending 12 disciples, chapter 9, then the 70 in chapter 10. We have noticed that the last time. And the grace of God is something that needs to be presented and that God wants this to be extended as far as he can. But in the portion that we have read tonight, we see also the extent of the grace of God, how far it goes, in contrast to the Judaistic system of those days. 
And we need to uh, realize, we hope to see more about that in chapter 11, how the Lord Jesus was already rejected by the leaders at this moment. We have seen at the end of uh, the portion that we had last time, how the Lord Jesus uh, rejoiced in those 70 that they came to, when they came back, but then he said in verse 20, Rejoice that your names are written in the heaven. And the, re- the Lord rejoiced in the spirit, and then he said, I praise thee, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from wise and prudent, verse 21, and hast revealed them to babes. Yea, Father, for thus has it been well pleasing in thy sight. And then we have also read in verse 24, for I say to you that many prophets and kings have desired to see the things which ye behold and did not see them, and to hear the things which ye hear and did not hear them. What does that mean? That the disciples, and even those seventy, were very privileged people. The Lord puts them in this category of babes, verse 21, but he also puts them in the category of verse 24, that they are even more blessed than the prophets and the kings of the Old Testament. Now, at that moment, this lawyer is introduced. Perhaps he was present. He heard that the Lord said this. And so here at this moment, Luke introduces this lawyer who represented this Judaistic system. And not only that, it's not only a matter of the Mosaic law, it's also a matter that he represented a whole system that has been built upon the Mosaic law. And so this lawyer represented that system, where the Lord and those seventy represented the grace of God. Not that the Lord was doing anything against the law. The Lord Jesus, he was a perfect law observer at that time. Before the cross, we see that the Lord Jesus was perfectly uh, observing the law. So nothing could be said against him on that count. But he represented at the same time the grace of God with those twelve, with the seventy, and here the lawyer, he stood up. It indicates here is a difference. Here is someone who takes exception to what was presented before. And we also see how he has a bad motive in doing this. He wanted to tempt the Lord. And this is a strong word in the original, means to put him to the test in a very strong way. The same word is used in the temptation in the wilderness with the Lord, of in 1 Corinthians 10, that the people attempted God when they were in the wilderness during it. This is a very strong word. And so, this is not good to tempt the Lord this way. He puts him to the test. It represented opposition. Not only that, not only opposition, the intent was to make the Lord fall. Of course, that cannot happen. You know that. It's often these those questions that... Um, Either way you answer, one answer would make, uh, bring in an accusation, or the opposite answer would bring in another op- uh, accusation. For example, if the Lord would have said, well, you don't have to do anything, you get eternal life just the way you are, that would have been wrong. If he would have said, well, there are other requirements needed, besides the law of Moses, that would also be wrong. So this man was tempting the Lord, trying to get a wrong answer from him, and then have a ground for accusation. You have to understand that at this time, when the leaders had rejected the Lord, they were looking for argument. And that is why we read that he came to tempt him, tempt him, try to make the Lord stumble, and then have an argument against him. And so the Lord approaches him then, on the same ground, you will see that. So the question is, teacher, first of all, uh, with this, I want to mention, he does not recognize the Lord as Lord. He does not recognize him in his authority. He only sees him as a rabbi. Just like Nicodemus, when he came to the Lord in the night in John 3, he recognized him as a great teacher. And this man recognized him as a teacher, as a rabbi. But he was not willing to submit himself to the Lord. Are we willing to submit ourselves to the Lord as a great teacher and recognize his authority? We will see later, at the end of the portion that we have read, there was one who did that. That's exactly what Mary did. Mary was seated beside the feet of the Lord Jesus. That was an expression of submission. In those days, the rabbis at school, and they had their pupils 
at their feet. But it was not a custom that a woman would take place at the feet of a rabbi. That would not be tolerated. But in Mary's case, we have read, she sat at the feet of the Lord Jesus and she was taught by him. Whereas this man was not willing to take a place at the feet of the Lord Jesus. He was not willing to be taught by him really. He wanted to have an accusation against the Lord. So the motive was wrong of this question. The question was good, but the motive was wrong. Having done what? So it goes back to the Old Testament where we are instructed that if they would do these things, they would live. Deuteronomy 29 and other scriptures refer to that. We will go back to that in a moment. And the question is, what do I need to do or what, on the basis of what I have done already? Because he, he saw himself as having accomplished the things that are needed. And so having done what? He saw himself already as one who had succeeded in doing the right thing. And so is that then good enough to inherit life eternal, eternal life? Now the question of eternal life in the Old Testament is known, Psalm 133, we find the expression in Daniel 12. We have not much about eternal life in the Old Testament. The only thing we could suggest on the basis of the Old Testament is looks forward to the age to come, the world to come, the millennium, the age of blessing. Now, we of course, we know much more about eternal life. Psalm 316 and many other scriptures uh, open a, bit, a much wider perspective of eternal life. But that's not the perspective that this man had in mind. He had just in mind what the law said, do this and you shall live. Now the Lord answers therefore on that same basis. He puts him on that ground because he, that's the ground that he takes. So notice here, although the Lord Jesus represents the grace of God, as I said earlier, he doesn't set aside the law. The time had not come yet. The Lord had not died yet. The, Lord, the law was not fulfilled yet. Romans 10 verse 4. So the Lord puts this man on the basis on which he stood and the basis that he claimed. And that is why the Lord asked these two questions. What is written in the law? How readest thou? And these questions are important. Not only what is written, but also how he would read. And already there this man failed. This man was reading in a wrong way. Okay? So even those two questions that the Lord asked would really challenge this man if he would be honest. And that's also, by the way, important for us not only to know what we read, even in the scriptures, but also to do it with the right motive. How read it thou? Now again, we are here on the basis of the law. We are here in the fear of the law. And I have a little pamphlet, and you can take it if you want. We cannot go into much detail now. The difference between grace and law. We are under grace. So we could study that starting from here and then go through the New Testament and see how we are now under grace and how there is a different order of things. But that has not been introduced yet. At this time, the old order of things was still prevalent, and so the Lord answers in connection with that order of things. But if you compare this, for example, with John 20, verse 31, the summary of John's gospel, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life through his name, that introduces this new order of things. But this man was not ready for it. This man was only ready to approach things on the basis of his own effort. And so the Lord keeps him there in verse 27. He gives the answer and he gives the right answer. This man answers the right way. By the way, uh, this is not the same question as we have later in this book, in chapter uh, 18, I think it is, or what you have also in Matthew 22, a lawyer that came uh, to the Lord. There are other occasions that similar questions were asked. But uh, you can compare that uh, on your own. Matthew 22, Mark 12, so this man answers this question now himself, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy understanding. That is the summary of the law in one sense. And then he knew the law very well because then he adds, And thy neighbor as thyself. And the Lord recommends him for this because many people would have only quoted the first part. Uh, they were familiar with the Shema, the hear ye, O Deuteronomy 6, verse 5, and that was that they should love the Lord with all their heart and so on. That was uh, something that they recited every day. But the second part, that you would love your neighbor as yourself, the, the notes uh, refer to uh, Leviticus 19, verse 18, that was less known. So this man knew the law very well, and he could answer this very briefly. I just uh, underline 
those four expressions, thou shalt live, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, from the heart are the issues of life, Proverbs 4, 23, with all thy soul, soul connected with desires, with emotions, with all thy strength, so connected with the will, with all thy understanding, connected with the intellect, so here we see the whole human being in a very glow, uh, very universal way, four, and four ways represented. And all these different faculties should be used to love the Lord. Now only the new nature will respond to this. Only the new nature, we have received the love of God in our hearts through the Holy Spirit whom, him, whom we have received, Romans 5, 5. Only a new nature can re respond to this. But on the base of the law, do this and you shall live, no one could ever achieve that. That is the, also the point of the illustration that will follow. On the base of our, our own efforts, we will not achieve this. Although it is a righteous requirement, God, God is the creator, he is right to require this from his creatures. But the scriptures also show that in our own strength we will never succeed. The best example is Paul of Tarsus, the zealous Jew. He did not succeed. So if he did not succeed, who else can succeed? Now the second point, thy neighbor as thyself, we have to understand that the Jews at that time had limited the scriptures very much. You know how they interpreted that? They said, the neighbor is someone who is someone of us who is near. So they limited already to the, uh, a fellow Jew who would be close by, his neighbor, for example, in the next door. So they limited the concept of the neighbor very much. And that is why the Lord will explain that in more detail in a moment. Now, this word neighbor we find 21 times in the New Testament in, in, the, in the Greek text. This is uh, very striking. And the true understanding, as I said earlier, can only come with the new nature. And 1 John 5, 20, verse 20 says that we have now the understanding. So man in his own capacity, in his own strength, will never achieve. It takes a new nature, it takes this new understanding that God gives. And then we will also be able to fulfill the second part of the law. Not that we are under the law of Moses, we are under the law of Christ now, as you know from Galatians 6 and other scriptures. So the Lord answers this man on his own, on the base where he stands. He challenges him then to answer his own question. You see the wisdom the Lord has, that way he could not be condemned. And now he answers the second question. When this man wanted to justify himself, okay, verse 28, he said to him, thou hast answered right. That's the right answer. But this man had no resources to do what he said. That was very important. And that is now going to be illustrated in this parable. The Lord says, This do, and thou shalt live. As I said, this is the summary of the law. Do this, and you shall live. And James says, Be doers of the word, not hearers only. This man was a hearer, but not a doer. So he was condemned. And this parable that follows shows that very clearly. It says in verse 29, he desires of justifying himself. We have already seen, he saw himself already on the right foundation, and now this was scattered by what had transpired. And so he wanted to justify himself. Just like Adam and Eve in Genesis 3, they tried to justify themselves before a holy and righteous God. It doesn't work. This man tried to justify himself. It doesn't work. We cannot find any righteous ground in our own efforts, on the basis of our own words. Uh, Galatians and Romans show that in detail, and so the Lord is going to show this with this parable, that this man could not do it in his own strength, although he wanted to justify himself. And so the Lord exposes this man. Note, notice how wise the Lord approaches him. This man was trying to expose the Lord, and trying to make him fall. Now the Lord, in his grace, it is grace still, but grace and truth go together, he exposes this man by presenting this parable. So, who is my neighbor? Jesus replying, says, the Lord's going to give an object lesson. And there are many things that we can uh, take from this parable, but let us take it in a simple sense as it comes to us in this setting. It was to explain to this man that he was not able to justify himself that it would not work, and the illustration shows this very clearly. A certain man descended from Jerusalem. Now that's going down, 
about 17 miles, the road, about 17 miles, it goes down about 3,000 feet, so it's very steep. It was in that area that many robbers uh, had their place, and we see here, he went from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers. Now, Jerusalem is a divine center. Jericho is a place of the curse. It was cursed in the time of Joshua. It was rebuilt in the days of Ahab. And even then, the curse was still maintained. This was a place of the curse. And there we see an illustration of how man is, the religious man, the Jew, is far away from God. Even those proud Jews who were there in Jerusalem, they were not better than this rock, than this um, man that fell into the hands of the robbers. And so we will see at the end of the conclusion when the Lord says, Go and do thou likewise, that this has two meanings. We will see that in a moment. First of all, this man needed to learn to see that he was like this man that came down. The second lesson that he had to learn to show mercy, do thou likewise, to show compassion. Those two tests he could not stand, he failed. But these are the two tests that the Lord presented to him. And so he we see that he fell into the hands of robbers, the robbers representing Satan's kingdom, uh, violence, corruption. Satan is the murderer from the beginning, the father of the lie. This is what these robbers represent. By the way, the word fell into is only used three times in the New Testament. And we see it has to do with God's sovereignty. James 1 verse 2 says, Count it as mere joy, my brethren, when you fall into various temptations or trials. That word, fall into various temptations or trials, is the same verb used here. The other time it's used is in Acts 27 when the ship had made shipwreck. The ship that Apostle Paul was on, this all the people there made shipwreck, fell into a certain dry place or where there was not much water. That is the other occasion where this verb is used. Only three times in the New Testament. But these three times show clearly that who is in control? God. God allowed this to happen. And so that is important for us to realize. Things happen, but it's under God's providence. First, Tsuris uh, describes the result of this attack. He was stripped. He was wounded and robbed and left in a half-dead state. This is an illustration of what we find in Ephesians 2, where we see how we are dead in sins and trespasses. Also, this Jewish man, although he was an observant law keeper as far as it went, was dead in trespasses and sins, spiritually dead, although physically alive. And that is presented in this half-dead state. Furthermore, he represented the ministry of condemnation. You can read Second Corinthians chapter 3 and you see how Paul describes this whole ministry of condemnation. This ministry of the law is a ministry of condemnation and it is a ministry of death. That is what this man represented, this lawyer represented this ministry of condemnation and death. And so he was in a hopeless state. This half-dead man represents really, illustrates a condition that he was totally unable to do anything for himself to change this hopeless situation and it was he was also helpless helpless and hopeless now he is really cast on God but before God comes in we see the priests and the Levites passing by they represented that religious system that this man this lawyer also represented and it is very striking to see that the priest happened to go down again Nothing happens by accident. He happened to go down. Again, God is in control. God allowed this to happen at that very moment. And he also was going down. That is very uh, remarkable. But seeing him pass on the opposite side, so there was no compassion. Perhaps this man was afraid. He could not discern whether this man was really dead or half dead. So he would conclude this man is dead and he could not do anything because if he would touch this dead person, he was defiled and he could not uh, continue his ministry uh, for the time being. And then in verse 32, we see the Levite, who was a helper of the priest. With the priest, we see especially the Godward aspect of the, this ministry. With the Levite, the manward aspect. And so the Levite, he 
makes more effort. He comes to the spot, in verse 32, he came and looked at him and passed on on the opposite side. So he made even more effort, but he didn't do anything either. So these two examples describe the religious system, but they also describe what this lawyer really stood for. He was not going to show any compassion to uh, others. So they could not give help. This man was helpless and hopeless, and this religious system could not provide any help. That was a very important point. But, verse 33, you notice, but, the but in scripture are very important. But a certain Samaritan. Now, this Jew that was stripped by the robbers and uh, had these wounds and robbed and so on, if he would be on his journey and a Samaritan would pass and would offer him a glass of water, he would refuse it. There were many reasons the Jews despised the Samaritans. Of course, it goes back to the history past when there was this mixture between pagan uh, religion, the ten tribes, uh, they had been transported from other countries through under the Assyrian, and so they represented really a system that was not according to God. In fact, they had even built a counterfeit temple to compete with the temple of Jerusalem. So we can understand why they were not well seen. There are some references to the Lord Jesus as the Samaritan. There are other, other names that they are used to indicate him. But it expresses their hatred, how they despise the Lord. And now it's exactly the Samaritan that comes along, the certain Samaritan. He is going to have compassion. He's coming to help. But we have to realize this is the one that is so much hated by the Jews. They didn't want him. But he is the only one who's going to give help, whether they like it or not. He's the only one that could help. And as I said, in chapter 11, we'll see even more how they rejected him. But the Samaritan was very much rejected by the Jews, the religious Jews in those days. The second point, we see he was journeying. He was on a journey. Now, uh, how inconvenient it is when you are on a journey and you have to uh, pay attention to a case like this. Very inconvenient. But the Samaritan did it. The Lord Jesus came from heaven. What an effort that he made in order to help us. It, it's indescribable. We see him often on a journey. Also later in this book we see him on a journey back to heaven. But here he's on the journey. He came from heaven. It's like an allegory here. Now the verse goes on to say he came to him. So the Samaritan here is above this religious prejudice of the Jews. The Samaritan, if he would have uh, reason just like the Jews, Samaritan would have passed by and that no Jew could ever have accused him. That was normal. But here we see that this Samaritan is above the religious prejudice and that was exactly with the Lord. He was above the religious prejudice. And that's what this lawyer needed to learn, to be above this religious prejudice. The fourth point is seeing him. It's the same word that we see with the priest and the Levite. Although it is translated in one case see and in another case look, it's the same word. But what a difference. After seeing, so after observing, he is moved with compassion. So the Samaritan really represents what's in God. In Ephesians 2 we see how God moved, was moved with compassion towards us. In Romans 5 also. And those two passages show God's compassion to us who were found in this half dead state. And came up. So he added action to his compassion. We may have, we may feel compassion and then it stops. No. The Samaritan, he added the action to it. He came near and then bound up his wounds. So he uses the best available remedies and then the best provisions that are available, oil and wine. The wine perhaps to cleanse the wounds and to dis disinfect in the oil, but in any case, both figures speak of the Holy Spirit, the provisions we have in the Holy Spirit, the oil and the wine, and the wine that produces joy, ultimately. So these are wonderful provisions that this Samaritan brings in. And that's another illustration. The Lord Jesus, the Samaritan, hated by these religious Jews, he represents God's provisions, a new order of things. And he will bring in, the minister of the Holy Spirit, he will bring in, through joy, the wine, real help. 
Not only that, having put him on his own beast, so he is now going to walk himself, and the poor man is going to be carried on his donkey. So this shows the greatness of his grace. I'm sure even the children can understand a little bit of the greatness of the compassion of this man, that he would take all this care and then bestow all this care upon this man whom he didn't know, but he met him on the road and that is why he became a neighbor to him. And then it's not stopped here. When he had taken him on his donkey, he brought him to the inn. And that's a very interesting expression, the word inn, uh, in the original means a place where all are received. So all people who are in need, who need help, are received here in God's inn, as it were. That's the inn that represents also the assembly, where there's a room for all to be received in their needs. We'll see in a moment there is also another aspect uh, in connection with the ministry of the Lord Jesus. But here, when it comes to the need of people, there is then room for all to be received. The, the, the word in literally means all, a place where all are received. And the innkeeper, his name is very intimately connected with that God, one who receives all. And so the Lord Jesus in his grace, he would receive all who come in repentance and through faith. And then it says, and he took care of him. So he continued to bestow care on him, even when he was there in the inn. That's exactly what the Lord has done with us. Verse 35, and on the morrow as he left, taking out two denarii, he gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou shalt expend more, I will render to thee on my coming back. Now, I know there are people who don't want to see this as an allegory, they would only see it as a parable, and even if we take it just as a parable, it uh, serves its purpose, we see the extent of compassion that is needed instead of approaching God on the base of our own efforts and then even despising our neighbor. So even when we take it in a literal context as an illustration, as an object lesson for this lawyer, it's already very far-reaching. But perhaps we can also see it as an allegory, as I have tried to explain a little bit, and then there are also many lessons connected for us, but the first meaning is really this parable and to describe how far we were away, totally helpless, we couldn't do anything, and then how we were dependent on the care of the neighbor. And so the great lesson that comes in at the end is this, are we willing to see that in ourselves we are just like this man falling into the hands of the robbers? and that we are dependent on the care of the neighbor. The Lord Jesus, he showed himself as a true neighbor, the Samaritan, okay, let's just limit ourselves to the par uh, parable. The Samaritan, he showed himself to be a true neighbor. And the question would be twofold. First of all, do I see myself as one who is totally helpless, who is really dependent on the care of this neighbor, this Samaritan? Secondly, if I'm a believer, if I'm a Christian, am I willing to bestow this care, to show this compassion and mercy on others? There are two questions, really. And so when the Lord says, he even refused to, the, the lawyer did not want to mention the Samaritan, he just said, he that showed mercy. Now, that was the one who was the true neighbor, the one who showed mercy. And then the Lord says, you go and do likewise. In other words, you be a neighbor, even if it is a Samaritan. You show this mercy. You show this. But I also think that it's implied in this parable that this man needed to see himself in the picture of the man who had fallen into the hands of the robbers. That would also apply to this man, this lawyer. The lawyer was just like this man falling into the hands of the robbers. Secondly, as a religious person, he was challenged with this question, if you want to keep the law, show them mercy. Show what God is. God is a merciful God. And that was, even in the law of Moses, repeated many times, uh, the need to bestow mercy on the neighbor. Many examples could be given from the law itself. Even. So the, law just, the, the Lord here just maintained what the law has already presented. And so this man failed the test completely. He wanted to test the Lord, but 
the Lord turns the table, and this man failed the test. But in this, at the same time, we have very, very deep lessons. Just one more word about mercy in verse 37. He that showed mercy, that's what God has done towards us. He showed mercy. That is what God is going to do in the future towards Israel. The same rebellious attitude you have here in the, in the law of the religious man. In Romans 11, we see how God will reach them ultimately and show mercy to them. God has shown mercy to the Gentiles after the Jews had rejected their own Messiah. But in the future, God will show mercy again to Israel and they will be restored. We know that from Romans 11. So, the one that showed mercy ultimately is God. But the point is that God wants to use his people, that his people may be instruments to show what is in God's heart. And so that's the challenge for us today, that we will be instruments to show what God is. God is the Father of mercy, the God of all compassion. And so God wants us to reflect these features. And the end of verse 37, when the Lord says, Go and do likewise, you could translate it this way, go and keep on doing likewise. Uh, James also confirms it. Now we are under the law of grace. And even under the law of grace, the same standards apply that God wants us to show mercy. If that was already the case under the Mosaic law, it's also the case under the new law of liberty under which we are, the law of Christ, that we would show mercy. So this is also a challenge for us. But on this handout, I have many more points referring to grace under which we are. Now, the second portion we have read tonight is this well-known portion where we see the Lord on a visit. So, I repeat again, he's on this journey, but he's now very close to Jerusalem. And it says here in verse 38, it came to pass as they went. So, they, it is the Lord and the disciples. He entered into a certain village. And a certain woman, Martha by name, received him into her house. How wonderful! Just a, a practical lesson. Would our house be open for the Lord to receive him? Not only that, he had twelve disciples with him. That's quite a challenge. And this house was open for him to be received. Notice also, Martha received him. It's the same in the original, the same root that we had with the in where all are received. But now the Lord is received in a house. Now we come to the next phase, as it were, in, in Luke's uh, writing. It's God's desire that all are received. But when they are received, they are in a house. And so Martha's house here is an illustration of what God has in mind to have people in his house. And so the believers today are in the house of God. And that's a concept that is much developed in Luke. Much uh, we will see that also in other chapters, 14 and 15 and 19, we see, for example, the Lord says to Zacchaeus, I need to be in your house. So the house becomes a place where we have an illustration of the house of God. And there is a company in that house uh, which is in tune with God. Here we see that illustrated by Mary, and you see that Martha needed a correction. But before we get there, maybe... Martha's husband had died. We don't know whether she had been married, but from Matthew 26, we see that the Lord later was in the house of Simon. And that is where Mary anointed him then. So perhaps we may uh, take from that passage that Martha's, Martha had a husband who, was, who had been a leper and had passed away in the meantime. I, we don't know all the details. But the point is here that Martha had opened her house for the Lord and that the Lord was welcomed there. She received him. What a privilege to receive him. I think of uh, Peter in John 13 verse 8. The Lord says, if I do not wash your feet, you cannot have part with me. Here in the house, the purpose was that there would be fellowship. She received the Lord that he would find a place of rest and that there will be fellowship. Wonderful privilege. Also in the book of Acts, one example we find Lydia who opened her house to Paul and Silas and who were with them. And so the house became then the nucleus of the assembly. So the house is connected with the assembly many times in the scripture. Now what we find now in verse 39, 
So we see here the house place that the Lord is received in view of fellowship and we see also in view of teaching because that comes out now in verse 39. And she had a sister called Mary who also, having sat down at the feet of Jesus, was listening to his word. First of all, the meaning, the, the meaning of the names. Martha means she was rebellious. Mary is from Miriam and it means their rebellion. That's from the Hebrew and it's very remarkable as far as the background is concerned there was not much difference but by the grace of God both had opened their hearts for the Lord and as we have seen Martha also had opened her house for the Lord and here is Mary there in this may I say assembly setting there is Mary as we said earlier the Lord the great teacher she is now at his feet it was not limited to man in in Christianity we see that uh, men and women are put on the same foundation. They have different roles, but essentially they have the same value before God. And we see that here illustrated already. Mary was seated there at the feet of the Lord Jesus to be instructed by him. Uh, we find in Moses' days that Moses was the great teacher and the people were at his feet. Exodus 11. Deuteronomy 33, uh, it's mentioned that the people was at his feet. We find uh, later also Paul was at the feet of Gamaliel. So the concept of a rabbi having disciples at his feet was very well known. And here we see the Lord Jesus, the great teacher, and Mary at his feet. Are we willing to take a place at the feet of the Lord Jesus? So the second question. The first question is, do we open our heart? Do we open our house for him? And secondly, are we also giving him this place that he can teach us? And are we willing to take a place of submission, to take a place of obedience, dependence, being swift to hear? This is the feet of the Lord Jesus. A little parenthesis here, we find five times in Luke's Gospel, people at the feet of the Lord Jesus. You have seen in chapter 7, the woman that was known as a sinner. She is found at the feet of the Lord Jesus in repentance. That's where it starts. It starts with repentance at the feet of the Lord Jesus. That was a wonderful illustration we have seen in Luke 7. But then, there's also this aspect. We've seen that in chapter 8. The man who was demon-possessed was delivered from the demons by the Lord. And then he was seated, clothed, and by his well uh, intelligence, he was thinking well, his capacity was restored. He is there at the feet of the Lord Jesus. There we have an illustration of the word of God. The, the, the two go together. Repentance, that you see in this woman. A word of God, that you see in this man that was freed and healed. And then we see, in, also in chapter 8, Jairus was found at the feet of the Lord Jesus with his request, because his daughter was going to die. So we have seen that earlier. And here we have the fourth occasion of someone at the feet of the Lord Jesus. It's very interesting to follow those examples in Luke's Gospel. Way further, in chapter 17, we will see one of those ten Samaritans that was healed. Now, amazing. That it is, again, in Luke's Gospel, there were, no, excuse me, there were not ten Samaritans, there were ten lepers. One of those lepers was healed, and only that man came back to worship, and he was a Samaritan. Isn't that striking? So here we find a Samaritan who bestowed mercy. In chapter 17 we'll see a Samaritan who received mercy and then became a worshipper, although he was a Samaritan. So that is the fifth occasion where we have a worshipper and then at the feet of the Lord Jesus. So those five go together. They are very intimately linked together. Here we have the fourth example, someone at the feet of the Lord Jesus to be taught. And it actually... We see that also with Mary. She was taught first, she prayed at the feet of the Lord Jesus, John 11, and then she was a worshipper in John 12. We are very familiar with those three points. But here is the first point. It starts with the word. And when we are instructed, then we also know how to pray. And when we know how to pray, then we can also be ready to worship. And that is what we find in John 12. The three go together, and you cannot miss one of the points. We need the three at the same time. It says also, I don't know whether you have it in your translation, also in the King James it says, which also sat at the feet of Jesus. What does that mean? She was not lazy. 
she was not neglecting her job. I've known a sister and she was in love with the word of God. It's beautiful, it's wonderful, I've, I've not anything against it. But she neglected her household completely. That was not right. We should be all in love with the word of God and take it in. But we should also do our job. And this is what Mary did. It was not that she neglected her duties. She found time to also sit at the feet of the Lord Jesus. And I would even read it this way. She was taught at the feet of the Lord Jesus. And that is how she could serve. So this is a matter of priority. We'll see that at the end of the chapter, uh, summarized by the Lord himself. Mary had done the right thing. She put the priorities right. With Martha, it was first me and myself, although she used all her faculties to serve the Lord, but it was me and myself. And that was something that she had to learn. So the Lord could appreciate the fact that Martha opened the house, that she would serve wonderful qualities, wonderful things. But what was wrong then with Martha? We don't read much about that. The only thing we read is this, in verse 40. Martha was distracted, or she was preoccupied. She was overly occupied to a point that she, it became something of her own. She became selfish. Even in serving the Lord, you can become selfish. That's what happened to Martha. So she did it for the Lord. But in fact, she became the center instead of the Lord being the center. You see how subtle these things are? We can serve the Lord and put ourselves in the center. That's what Martha did by this remark. She was distracted with not serving. Now, there was nothing wrong with serving, but the way she did it was wrong. She put herself on a pedestal, as it were, by doing this. She did not take a low place like Mary, but she put herself in the foreground by serving the Lord. There was something wrong. Now, the Lord did not give a whole discourse. He did not say, hey, Mary, what? that's wrong. Stop doing that. Forget about this. Listen. And no. The Lord says only in verse 31, 41, Martha, Martha. That's how tender the Lord is. Just by saying Martha, Martha, he was already correcting her. We can read others who have been called in the scriptures twice. For example, uh, Peter, Simon, Simon. He needed correction. Simon, Simon. You better listen. Martha, Martha, you better listen. And she got her lesson because in John 12 we see that she was serving again. There was nothing wrong. She got her lesson. So what do we see with Martha? Someone who is willing to take correction. With Mary we see someone who is willing to be taught at the feet of the Lord Jesus. That's the best place. But with Martha we see then that she was willing to be corrected. Are we willing to be corrected? That's quite a challenge. We often we are not willing to be corrected. Martha was willing to be corrected. Here we have an example of feet washing. Now, she was worried about many things, and there we come now to this matter of priority. The Lord says to her, you are careful or distracted. We could read distracted or worried. She was worried and troubled about many things. The word worried here really means you are drawn between two uh, goals. Like the Lord is one goal, Martha was the other goal, and she was drawn in between all the time. That is this word careful or distracted. What lesson can we learn from this? We need a single eye. With Mary, you see that single eye. She was totally taken in by the Lord. The Lord was her all. Although she was also doing her job, as we have seen, she also was serving. But she had a single eye. She did it with the right motives, and the Lord was her all. We'll come back to that in a moment with this thought of the need. But I want to finish this thought now. With Martha, she was distracted. She was not single eyed. She needed to learn this lesson so that the Lord would be the only object for her and that she would serve only the Lord and not be any more important herself. And then she would not be worried and distracted anymore. And so here the matter of priority comes in. The single eye goes with the right priorities. Mary had the right priorities. Why did she have the right priorities? Because of the single eye. What do you read in Psalm 27, verse 4? One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that shall I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord to behold the glory of the Lord. That's what David says. There's the single eye. That is what is needed. 
It reminds me of Philippians 3 verse 8 that Paul says, One thing I do. So he had his eyes fixed on the Lord. He had the right priorities because his eyes were fixed on the Lord. Are our eyes fixed on the Lord? If not, we fall in the same pitfall as Martha. Not to speak of the lawyer. The lawyer, he was lacking one thing. The Lord says it later to another lawyer. One thing is lacking. Or you lack one thing. Go and sell everything you have and then give it to the poor and then come and be my disciple. This is what we find later in Luke 18. There was one thing lacking with that lawyer. He did not have a single eye. He was not even born again. With this Martha, she was born again, and there was also something lacking because she was distracted. She was, her eyes were on the Lord and on herself. Whereas with Mary, her eyes were only on the Lord. Just like with David in Psalm 27, just like with Paul in Philippians 3. So this is the right example for us. And in John 9, the man that was born blind, he could say, I know only one thing, that I was blind and now I see. That is the Lord's work, this one thing. So this is the right priority, and Mary has chosen the good part. So the right priority goes with the eye fixed on the Lord, the single eye, and it goes together with the good part. What is the good part? This reminds us of what I said earlier. In John 13, verse 8, the Lord says, If I do not wash your feet, you have no part with me. The good part is really fellowship with the Lord. The good part is eternal life, what his lawyer was speaking about, but he didn't have it. The good part is being at the feet of the Lord. Absorb him, being really like Paul, Philippians 3 verse 8, doing one thing. That is the good part. The Lord is all. This word is found, for example, Colossians 1 verse 12, 13, where we have this part now that God has given us, inheritance. A wonderful part that we have received, a good part, which shall not be taken from her. This part the enemy cannot take. So may the Lord help us to follow the example of Mary and also mark his example and be correctable, to be adjustable, to open our house to him, to serve him, and then receive lessons as we need to go along. There are many lessons, of course, in this portion. This is a portion we all love. And we can draw so many more lessons, but the time is over. If there are questions or things that need to be clarified, uh, please uh, speak up and we will conclude with that.